Perfect. Okay. Well, welcome everyone to today's webinar. We're really excited to be with you today to talk through how we can um, support youth and families that we work with by taking on an ecological approach to our work. Um, as Michelle mentioned, my name is Dr. Rachel Schumacher. I'm a licensed psychologist and assistant professor at the Monroe Meyer Institute at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Um, I was trained as a school psychologist and my work and research really focus on early identification and intervention of early childhood problems. And good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Caitlin Young, also a licensed psychologist and a licensed school psychologist. Um, I'm also an assistant professor at the Monroe Meyer Institute and specialize in school mental health systems and practices. I'm really excited to see you all here today. It's going to be hopefully pretty helpful. <laughs> Yes, and so that leads us into our learning objectives. So today we really hope that we can share some great um, uh, evidence-based tools and practices for assessing childhood and adolescent mental health concerns with you. We hope you are able to, to gain some new knowledge and, and um, about evidence-based practices for treating childhood and adolescent mental health concerns within this ecological approach, as well as identify tools to help us all more effectively navigate the impact of social media on the perception of mental health diagnoses. Okay, so here in the state of Nebraska, serious mental illness means any mental health condition that current medical science affirms is caused by a biological disorder of the brain, and it substantially limits the life activities of the person with a serious mental illness. Um, and so in this definition, um, they include schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, delusional disorder, bipolar affective disorder, major depression, and obsessive compulsive disorder. But in our presentation today, we are really adopting a broader approach to mental illness, um, especially because we are hoping to catch these concerns before they get to be to this most serious level. Okay, we'll start off by talking about um, screening and assessing for mental health concerns. You know, in your previous webinar last week, um, you got some information about assessing for interventions. Um, so we're not going to go over all of the specific like DSM criteria and all that jazz. You can find that information in our supplemental materials at the end of this presentation. Um, but if you can... We really just wanted to highlight that mental health problems are affecting about one in five young people at any given time, but unfortunately about two thirds of these young people with mental health problems aren't getting the help that they need. In fact, the average delay between when mental health symptoms first appear and intervention is started is about 11 years, which is way too long. Um, we know through research that early identification and treatment leads to better outcomes. We know that early treatment can lessen long-term disability and prevent more significant mental health problems from, from developing. And so we really encourage you to incorporate uh, mental health screening practices um, to allow for earlier identification and intervention and help bridge this gap between mental health concerns and, and the lack of intervention. And so in our supplemental resources slide, you'll find links to commonly used screening tools. And we really tried to include a lot of free screening tools that are easy to, easy to administer. Unfortunately, unlike many medical concerns, there isn't um, like a clear blood test or x-ray or MRI that can confirm whether or not an individual um, has a mental health diagnosis. And because of this, it's important to adopt a um, multi-method, multi-informant approach to assessment. And so for many of these mental health concerns that we see in childhood and adolescent, we must see documented symptoms and impairment across settings and contexts. So when we're assessing for these um, concerns, we want to gather information from all of these settings and from all of the important people within the child's life. And so observations and interviews are helpful to give you some specific information about a child's strengths and areas of concerns and, and kind of the context within which we're seeing these problems. And then standard rating scales can help you to determine whether the child is exhibiting significantly more of these concerns or symptoms when compared to their peers. 
And so the main takeaway here is that diagnosing mental health concerns is a complex process, and we want to make sure we're doing a thorough job gathering a lot of information from multiple sources to um, inform our intervention and our, our assessment. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Schumacher. I mean, multi-method, multi-informant assessments are really such a key um, component to um, aiding youth and families and really understanding how we can best support them. And I don't know about you all, but TikTok <laughs> has been making my job pretty complicated in the last year. Um, I work a lot with teens who are explaining pretty serious mental health um, symptoms to me and parents may be saying, yeah, we're seeing that too, but maybe not. And we actually have the whole other list of concerns. Um, and in particular, I've been having a lot of teens use a lot of language surrounding me mental health disorders that I didn't even have that language until I was like in graduate school. So it's kind of been a little shock to my system here. And it's truly made my uh, job more complicated because I want to validate what the child is experiencing while also understanding how their symptoms actually present in their everyday lives. So with that, I want to hear from you all and you'll be experiencing a, lo a lot of polls today because we want to try to get you all um, engaged with our content. How has social media impacted you as a clinician? Um, a poll should now be launched. Um, and it looks like we're getting a lot of responses super quickly, seeing a few not at all, some somewhat, some a lot. I think it all kind of depends on what clinic you're in, what population that you see. Um, yeah. Awesome. I'll let a few more individuals try to jump in. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll. Um, I'll share the results here. Um, so yeah, uh, some of us are somewhat experiencing some of this, um, and some people are experiencing that a lot. Um, so it really just depends. And so as our job as, um, clinicians, um, we really just have to kind of disentangle and piece apart what symptoms are being presented and what symptoms maybe people are more interested in maybe learning about. Many individuals right now are really interested in understanding if autism spectrum disorders might explain some of the different things that they are experiencing. And there's a lot of information right now online, which is really awesome because I think everybody should have access to like this type of information and material um, that many parents and teens are better able to describe some of the things that they might be experiencing, as well as using a lot of clinical terms that I know I wasn't used to before. However, it's ultimately our job to then determine if the constellation of symptoms um, that they're presenting is a match for autism spectrum disorder, maybe some other things that they may be having more difficulties with. So that being said, it's really critical to receive a structured developmental history for the individual that you're working with. It's really critical to receive this because typically most symptoms present for autism spectrum disorders present within the first few years of life. It's not super common um, for symptoms to spontaneously appear in later life with a developmental disability or disorder like autism. Additionally, there are dark gender differences um, in how autism is diagnosed, with boys being more likely to receive an autism diagnosis versus girls. And something that social media has really highlighted, which I think is really awesome, is that um, kind of understanding the different experiences between genders or across sexes um, for autism spectrum disorders and how many females typically experience autism in the form of masking or maybe just being viewed as being quirky versus having more symptoms related to autism spectrum disorders. Um, there's a lot more research coming about um, or coming out regarding how we can identify autism spectrum disorders in girls and understanding how it might present differently um, because it really is an important disparity that does need to be addressed. Additionally, um, something that we're coming across a lot, you know, as we are, um, as we work for an institution that is a center for excellence in developmental disabilities, is some of the overlap between schizophrenia disorders or schizophrenia 
schizophrenia spectrum disorders and autism. Um, there is some overlap there, in particular with impairment, with the theory of mind, so understanding kind of the voice in our head that helps us kind of navigate, remember things, um, as well as difficulties in shifting focus and energy. So there is some overlap. Um, and that can make it difficult to kind of tease apart. But we pulled together a few pieces of literature that um, you have some, so you now have some information about how autism and schizophrenia disorders can overlap. So 30% of youth diagnosed with childhood onset schizophrenia have comorbid um, autism spectrum disorder. The odds of individuals with autism spectrum disorder having comorbid psychoses are about 5.6 through uh, 5.8 concordance, um, depending on really the form of psychosis. Individuals with autism spectrum disorder are at greater risk of developing um, psychotic illnesses, up to 28%. And however, at the end of the day, most patients with just autism spectrum disorder do not meet full duration criteria for most psychotic disorders. So although they may be showing some other symptoms, it's really critical. Um, the kind of best recommendation right now is really examining the full duration of some of these um, schizophrenia or psychosis symptoms to try to disentangle um, what might actually be presenting. All right. ADHD has also been another disorder that many are interested in understanding if they demonstrate symptoms too. Our ability to focus, complete tasks, remember things that we have to do and organize ourselves all fall under something that we call executive functioning. Our executive functioning is impacted by several mental health disorders, including ADHD, mood disorders like depression or bipolar disorder, and anxiety disorders. So um, it's really important, you know, that we validate, yes, you are experiencing a lot of difficulties with these things, but we need to first kind of tease apart, why are you experiencing difficulties with executive functioning? Is it because you're really anxious and you can't focus on what you need to do because you're focused on your worry thoughts? Um, or is it really a, a skill deficit that we need to build up in something like ADHD? And at the end of the day with executive functioning, it's really important to understand, especially for children, that they've had these types of skills modeled and they've had opportunities to practice um, these skills. So then when you are deciding between different diagnoses, it's really important that we conduct a thorough assessment of symptoms, examine the diagnostic criteria of the DSM, and understand the prevalence rates of different presenting concerns. On this slide deck, as Rachel was mentioning, um, you'll notice at the end of the slides um, that we've included several supplemental slides. And I believe Michelle shared out the slides maybe before a few people popped in so we can be sure that you all get them again so that those who don't have access to them yet um, can get those. Um, that these slides will also include a brief summary of all the diagnostic criteria of common childhood uh, disorders, as well as some different screening and assessment tools. And we tried to make sure that most of them were free and most of them were pretty easily um, able to be administered. So you can use that in your practice as you aid in your decision making. All right. Dissociative identity disorder has been another disorder that's gained a lot of traction on social media, especially TikTok, with many teens and young adults explaining their different alters and their different personalities. There's not a lot of research on dissociative identity disorders in childhood because it's a pretty rare disorder to begin with, um, even in adults. However, something to keep in mind um, is that individuals who may be feigning or reporting um, uh, dissociative identity disorder symptoms may only focus more on well-publicized symptoms, such as dissociative amnesia, just kind of forgetting different things without explanation, while underreporting other comorbid symptoms, things like depression. Um, really, I had to dive into the DSM to try to find some of this information because there truly is not a lot out there, but it is becoming, um, oh, it's becoming really popular on TikTok. And again, at the end of the day, a thorough assessment, multi-method, multi-informant is helpful in determining what the child may actually be experiencing. All right. 
So when faced with youth and parents reporting um, these concerns or maybe not understanding why you may not be providing certain diagnoses, reminding families of the utility of diagnosis can be helpful. I've done a lot of um, comprehensive assessments with teens in the last few years, and when they don't receive the diagnosis that maybe they're interested in or um, wanting, um, I can tell that they're visibly upset, and they tell me, like, well, you're wrong, and things like that, and I understand the frustrations, and so really what I lean into is really explaining the utility of the diagnosis, and that ultimately under the medical model, we often use this information diagnosis to gain access to additional services and to inform other providers what this kind of a general overview of the constellation symptoms might be. So when this happens, or if you've ever come across this, really explore why a certain diagnosis is important to them can kind of open up the door to more conversations about um, the parents' concerns for the child or the child's concerns for themselves. Um, and then maybe you can provide some information that may be pertinent to their understanding of what a diagnosis may or may not mean for, um, for them. So with all of that said, I want to remind you all that at the end of the slide deck, you're going to find a summary of various DSM-5 criteria, as well as some different free screening and assessment tools. Some of them might you might have a small fee for, but we try to make almost everything free. We're going to now hop into the rest of our content today and provide you all with some evidence-based strategies that can be used throughout childhood and adolescence to support not only youth, but ultimately the adults in the youth everyday context. I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Schumacher to get us started on that. Yes, thank you, Dr. Young. I know that social media has is, is been a number one request or, or topic of conversation in a lot of my um, appointments lately, so I appreciate the, the discussion. Um, so I, if you want to head on to the next slide, um, I first want to start by talking about kind of important core components that permeate therapy for all youth. Um, and then Dr. Young and I will each dive into some more specific therapy appoint, uh, components for both the younger child group and the adolescent group. So foundational to therapeutic success for all people, ranging from childhood to adulthood, is really establishing that positive and collaborative therapeutic relationship. So as their co-facilitator of change, it's important that you're getting to know the client and his or her family and practice flexibility so that you can meet them where they're at and really focus on, on building that rapport. Research has shown that the therapeutic alliance plays such an important role in enhancing, in enhancing treatment outcomes among individuals with a variety of disorders. Next. Okay, and it's important to recognize that our clients don't live in a vacuum, right? They live in a complex system of home, school, families, neighborhoods, cultural groups, etc., that may be influencing their strengths and their presenting concerns. And so an ecological approach um, to therapy recognizes this and integrates various personal and environmental factors in, to intervention. And I think I'm going to pause for a second. It looks like there was potentially a, a question in the chat here. Um, I, Dr. Young, would you like to yeah. jump back in and answer yeah. that? Yeah, of course. So somebody sent us a question. Thank you so much for sending us questions, by the way. We love doing answering anything that we can to the best of our ability is um, any explanation for why boys are being diagnosed more often with ASD. Um, I guess I can provide my two cents and then Dr. Schumacher, you can kind of provide your two cents as well. Um, so autism spectrum disorder um, historically was mostly studied um, on males. Um, and it so like really our understanding of the constellation of symptoms for autism spectrum disorder were really developed kind of from that presentation. Um, however, um, you know, I think we also want to consider the context, as Rachel has kind of just started to talk about ecological systems, that girls are really socialized to, um, you know, mesh with other individuals, um, to be kind of more so socially um, normative. And so, 
female um, individuals who are females and have autism spectrum disorder often know that they do a lot of what we call masking, or they really try to put on um, like a show, almost like a performance of like, this is how I'm expected to act. So I'm going to do this, even though that's maybe not something within their own comfort zone or what they're naturally tended to do. Um, so I think that's kind of how I would answer that question, Dr. Schumacher. I know this yeah. is kind of your area as well. So I'd love to get your input. Yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of build on that and say, I think a lot of the gender differences really stem from some differences in, in neuro, neurological functioning. And, and like Dr. Young was saying, that girls just naturally have a little bit more so, social motivation. In terms of early development, they tend to develop a little bit quicker than young boys and their, their skills in terms of being able to um, mimic and imitate other people are quicker developed. Um, and so they tend to be able to mask their symptoms in, in social situations. They also tend to, when we're looking at those restricted interests or repetitive behaviors, a lot of their restricted interests tend to be a little bit more socially appropriate. Um, they might be really interested in unicorns or cats, which doesn't seem as atypical as, as somebody who is more, who is highly interested in something like pipes and, and how the electric current runs through different things. And so um, I think part of it is, is again, girls are a little bit better able to mask things, but it sounds like there's a lot of just neurodevelopmental differences that are predicting or kind of contributing to these gender differences in, in prevalence. Um, okay, so in the future, if you guys could use the Q&A box to send in your questions, I think that will help Dr. Young and I stay on top of them a little bit better so we can answer them quicker for you guys. Um, but we'll, we'll try to pay attention to both the Q&A box and the chat box. Um, but I'm going to hop back over and kind of follow up with this ecological systems approach. So Dr. Young, if you could hit the next slide, please. Um, and so when we're looking at kind of the whole system within which a child is developing, um, we want to use this approach to therapy to recognize and integrate all of these various personal and environmental factors into our intervention approach. Specifically, thinking about parent and caregiver values and kind of understanding what their role is in supporting treatment goals. And then outside of that home system, working with school professionals and supporting our treatment goals. Um, and so we want to look at all of these different influences in terms of our case conceptualization and how we can incorporate them into our treatment approaches. Okay, moving on to, to psychoeducation, we all want to empower our clients by providing them with accurate education about their diagnosis, including symptoms, causes, triggers, common experiences, as well as prognosis, and the various treatment options that are available to them. So psychoeducation really increases their self-awareness and self-efficacy by providing clients with the tools to set goals for their treatment and to overcome challenges, and as well as help with relapse prevention. In terms of involving like families and schools in the psychoeducation process, it gives um, those important um, adults in a kid's life information about what are some developmentally appropriate expectations and goals for this child so that we can more um, accurately connect them to, to services. Okay. Um, and, and along with that, even though we are giving these diagnoses, um, as Dr. Young was mentioning, the, the real benefit of a diagnosis is to communicate with other providers and give them some information about the constellation of symptoms that a child is exhibiting. Um, and sometimes that helps connect them to additional um, services and supports outside of the therapeutic environment, but really within, within therapy, there's so much more benefit to identifying treatment goals based on the presenting concerns and the context of the child and the family rather than their diagnosis. So I often tell my clients, I'm less concerned about your specific diagnosis and much more concerned about helping you achieve your individual goals and addressing the areas that are causing some stress or challenge for you. Okay. We also know that all behavior serves some sort of purpose. And so one of our goals in therapy is to identify the purpose or the function of this child's behavior to help inform our intervention approach. 
So the common behavioral functions are listed here, escape, attention, access to tangibles, or sensory um, stimulation. Um, and so it, to help you identify the function, can think about when and where these behaviors are occurring, what is happening before and after the behavior, and this will help give you some clues into why the behavior is occurring. And then you can use this information about the function of the behavior to help develop more effective interventions. So, for example, if a child's acting out to escape a situation that they don't like, well, let's teach them more appropriate ways to escape those situations that they don't like or allow them to escape those situations early for demonstrating good behavior. Um, but of course, behavior is really complicated and, and can serve many functions. So um, another example, you might have a child who starts tantruming because they want to avoid cleaning their room, right? So that escape function. But then that tantrum behavior might be continued or maintained because the parents are providing it a lot of attention um, and it gets a reaction from those parents. And so we want to think about how we can address all of the functions of the behavior when we're creating our intervention. And finally, throughout treatment, it's also important to maintain a focus on continuous evaluation or progress monitoring of the presenting concerns and outcomes just to help inform our next steps in our treatment plan. So this data-based decision-making approach allows you as the therapist to modify your conceptualization and your treatment plans as necessary to make sure that we're always maximizing our patients' gains. Okay, so now I'm going to transition into diving deeper into some evidence-based strategies for working with young children in that 5 to 11-ish age range. Before I do that, any questions about our broad introduction into intervention? Okay. So... If you're interested in working with kids, a lot of us went into this field because we thought we were going to work with kids, but really an important component of working with kids is working with their families and working within their context and their systems. So in order to serve children mo most effectively, we must first and foremost focus our attention on the adults who are caring for these children every single day. So I'll spend the bulk of this part of the presentation really talking about how we can build up parents to be essential partners and change agents in this therapeutic process. But of course, there are still times where we need to, to focus on the child and involve the child in the therapy process by identifying what skills they're lacking and modeling and teaching and practicing and reinforcing those skills. And finally, in line with that ecological systems approach, it's also important to connect and partner with the child's school setting to create consistency in their expectations and discipline across settings since they spend so much of their day within the school setting. So when we're working on learning new skills or adjusting our parenting approaches, it's important to keep these few key principles in mind. We can frame these principles in terms of prevention or those things that parents can do beforehand to set their child up for success, as well as response or those things that parents can do in the moment um, that can impact the trajectory of their child's behavior. So we know that children learn best through play and through their relationships and their interactions with other people. And so when we're working with a child who comes in with some disruptive behaviors or any other mental health or developmental concern, we always want to start with prevention strategies and relationship building. So think about our child as having somewhat of an emotional piggy bank, right? And we're making deposits um, all the time in the form of positive interactions, such as hugs, play, praise, validation, words of affirmation. We're also making withdrawals in the form of demands or negative interactions, like giving instructions, asking questions, scolding, nagging, and giving consequences. And they're getting these deposits and withdrawals all day long. So we want to make sure that there are many more of these emotional deposits um, than withdrawals each day to ensure that our child isn't going into overdraft or, or these big emotional outbursts. And so within the parent-child interaction therapy approach, um, research is finding that children who receive 
more of that child-directed interaction that's really focused on play-based skills and, and managing behavior with positive attention before the parent-directed interaction phase, which is focused on like following directions and implementing con consequences. Those kids who get that relationship building phase first, they tend to be much more excited to work hard to follow directions and please their parents. So once the child becomes calmer and is enjoying time with their parents or their caregivers, including teachers, becomes easier for them to accept limits and, con uh, and consequences. So again, think about the type of boss you'd like to work for. Um, would you like one who's constantly withdrawing out of your piggy bank or one that's balancing their positive deposits and withdrawals? So there are a couple of tools here that you can use to help incorporate this um, relationship building as a prevention strategy in your work. And, and just for sake of time, I, I want to introduce you to the topics and not teach you exactly how to implement the topics. But we know that this special playtime um, can be a really easy, effective strategy to help parents and children build more positive connections for the child to receive just a little bit of therapy um, each day at home because they're finding ways to um, get that predictable dose of control that they are seeking out. Um, and they are, are doing that in a way that, um, so that parents can kind of get their control and their attention in at other times. Second, it's important to prevent misbehavior by structuring the environment to be more consistent and predictable. So routines are important for all children. The less predictable a situation is, the more emotional that child tends to become. So for example, think about being at a casino. You're sitting there in front of a slot machine. You keep putting in pennies or quarters or whatever it is because you never know when you're going to get that big payout. Um, this isn't like a very consistent or predictable experience or situation for you. Um, so you're going to keep trying. But when things are inconsistent and unpredictable like this at home, kids are also going to keep trying all of the things that may have worked for them in the past, like tantruming to get their way, because every once in a while it might still work out for them. But the more consistent and predictable things are in the environment, the quicker children are learning these, these rules and these expectations. So really focusing on helping families um, create structure by establishing some house rules and, and expectations. And again, you can see some links for, for how to walk families through this process. Um, we also have tools. Oops. You can also help structure the environment um, in the moment by using things like the when then or first then statements to help get kids to do that less than fun task that they feel like is going to be the worst thing in the world. So this is just a child friendly way to set up some structure and remind them that they've got some choice and some power in the situation and something positive to look forward to. You can also make situations more predictable for children by having consistent outcomes for when the child engages in positive behaviors um, and for having consistent outcomes when that child engages in misbehaviors. And so being predictable with those positive rewards and discipline can help reduce the child's emotionality. So for example, like when a child engages in positive behavior, we might say something like, great job, thank them give them a high five or something. But most of the time um, when their child is engaging in positive behavior, we likely don't give them a ton of attention. But when they engage in a misbehavior, what typically happens? They usually get a very predictable reaction from their parents, like reprimanding, scolding, reasoning, or having to go into this really lengthy explanation of cause and effect or talking about those future consequences. Um, and most of the time, that explanation is too difficult for the child to understand. And it's not really effective because everyone's already emotional and, and in the midst of a challenging situation. So we're not processing that information anyways. And these types of reactions from parents might accidentally be rewarding or motivating to the child because some attention from their parent is better than no attention in their world. So in other times, or in other words, a lot of times, more attention becomes available for misbehavior than it than is available for positive behavior. So when we forget to pay attention to positive behavior and we're paying a lot more attention to that misbehavior, they learn that that misbehavior gets them what they want, the attention. Um, so we have to work on creating a contrast in um, in their environment so that they're 
predictably receiving attention for positive behavior and getting really minimal attention for their misbehavior. Yes, Laura, that is a great example. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about how we can implement this um, strategy and practice. Okay. So again, we want to make try to use our attention strategically and teach parents how to use their attention strategically to help children learn what behaviors are appropriate and what behaviors are not. And so praise is one of the most powerful way to change anyone's behavior. So the more you hear praise, the more likely you're going to do the things that get you the praise, right? So if you think about you at work, when your boss gives you praise during a team meeting for formatting a document in a super helpful way, you're going to be more likely to continue to format future documents in that helpful way after receiving that praise. So same with kids. Um, and there's a lot of research to suggest that praise is associated with higher intrinsic motivation, a stronger internal desire to be helpful, and also promotes more family cohesion. Research also finds that praise is linked to increased gray matter in brain regions um, that are associated with emotion regulation and empathy. Um, so lots of positive benefits to praise, and it's such an easy strategy to use. Just like Laura was saying, I tell my clients to say, hey, I really love the way that you are using your walking feet right now. Super easy to do. Um, but while we know that praise has positive outcomes for children, we, we also know that the way we praise seems to matter and that certain types of praise are more effective. So the most important guidelines for praise is to really focus on the process instead of the person. We're trying to praise things that the child can control, like their behaviors or products or their choices, instead of praising things they can't control, like their intelligence. So instead of saying something like, you're so smart, we can try praising and saying, you worked so hard on that, way to go. I love how it turned out. Um, and then on the other hand, we, we know that behavior tends to decrease when it's not reinforced or given attention. And so we want to teach parents how to strategically turn their attention off for behaviors that they don't want to continue. And so this ignoring is supposed to be brief. And again, it's always done in the context of that positive parent-child relationship. Um, so you can see some examples here um, because we're not always going to um, ignore everything, right? So when we are seeing some dangerous or destructive behaviors, we want to ignore the child, but not the behavior. So we might remove the child to a safe location, but doing it in a way that provides minimal attention um, for more of those socially annoying or repetitive behaviors. Um, like if they're complaining while cleaning up, we can ignore the complaining and really focus on like, wow, thanks so much for following my direction to clean up. It's worth giving our attention to the things we want to see more of and not giving our attention to things that we want to, to decrease. And then sometimes, too, if we're just getting some random whining or talking with a loud voice, we can ignore both the child and the behavior because that behavior is annoying, but it's not causing anyone any any harm. OK, and so Ryan was asking, what strategies do you use with parents who understand these concepts, but they struggle to actually implement them? That is a wonderful question, um, because, yes, these strategies sound really easy um, in theory, but in practice, it's so hard to do. And that's where we want to make sure that we as a therapist are always modeling these skills in session and explaining to parents why we're doing what we're doing. Like, hey, looks like he's he's starting to get really loud right now. So let's turn our attention off. Let's focus on something that we can do over here until we see him quiet down. And then we're going to turn our attention immediately back on and praise him for using his inside voice. Um, and then, sorry, Dr. Young, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I'll just add something just as a little preview to some of the things um, that, that I use with teens is uh, motivational interviewing um, can also be really helpful and effective and just kind of wondering with the parent, you know, what's getting in the way of implementing these strategies mm -hmm. and then what kinds of things do we need to do to support and if it's because, well, nothing's changing, okay, so then we need to be sure of that 
it, we're actually, the, the function of the behavior is attention, right? That would make this an appropriate intervention. Um, as well as kind of going through the costs and the benefits of the parents continuing to maintain on this path of changing their behavior or just going back to what they were using. So I'll talk a little bit about motivational interviewing, and that's something I implement with parents all the time as well as teens. So I just wanted to jump in. And I think that's a great segue, too, to talk about, like, what's important to the parent? What does the parent value? And always trying to bring it back to, to their values and I would assume for most families, like they, it's important to them that they teach their child appropriate ways to behave. And we got to start on that, start on those, um, teaching those skills in the home setting so that they will generalize to, to other public settings. And so I also like to use the example, like, I know it's really hard to ignore. So maybe you just need to move yourself to another room. Maybe you need to put headphones in or kind of help, like Dr. Young was saying, help them identify ways to, to make this process easier for them to follow through. The last thing that we want to teach a child is that we can only ignore them for so long and then we eventually give in and and do whatever it is that they want or help them get what it is that they want because then it teaches them that they just have to try a little bit harder or or do this behavior a little bit longer and then it'll work out for them right we're we're, we're now we're not as predictable and consistent it's also important to to warn parents that when we try new strategies, sometimes behaviors kind of get worse before they get better. And it's because our new strategies aren't predictable for the child yet. Um, and so once we're consistent and predictable and, and doing this really well for a few times, then we're going to see less emotionality from the child. And so really being upfront with, with parents about what to expect with this process. Thank you for your questions. And um to kind of build on this, um, we're going to launch a poll here. We've got a 10-year-old boy that you're working with who constantly engages in a lot of annoying but repetitive behaviors while out in public. So for example, when going out to dinner with the family, he often jumps like a frog all the way um, from the car into the restaurant and into their table. His parents report that they often instruct him to walk normally, but he just yells back at them and continues to jump like a frog and do his own thing. His parents report feeling incredibly frustrated and embarrassed with this behavior and, and express to you, why can't he just walk like a normal person? So what differential attention strategies might you recommend to these parents? Okay. Put your answer on the in the poll. You can select as many um, responses that you think are appropriate. Actually, I lied. This one is just one appropriate response or one correct response. So it's looking like a, a good portion of people have been putting in their answers. And I'm sorry, you might not be able to see the full answer unless you make the screen really big. Okay, it looks like are the, are the answers shared, are the responses shared. And pretty much everyone was right on track here, right? We're, we're ignoring the jumping behavior while providing more attention for a, uh, for a more positive behavior. So we want to catch, catch this kiddo and praise him every time he's walking typically and appropriately. Um, but we can also try and praise and attend to any other positive behaviors that he's doing while he's jumping. So is he jumping with a quiet voice. So thanks for being quiet as we head back to our table. Thanks for following the, the waitress as we head back to our table. Um, and then if some of you picked practice appropriate walking behavior, um, either at home or at the restaurant. And I think we want to absolutely practice this behavior that's missing that we're not seeing in this kiddo. And we always want to practice this outside of the, the actual stressful situation. Um, so practicing it at home first, setting up opportunities to say, hey, walk down to your bedroom and back and then praise him for walking appropriately. 
And then sometimes you can practice appropriate walking behavior at the restaurant. But again, we want to keep this outside of the, the big situation. So when we're frustrated, we're not going to follow any instructions. And so we want to do that when everyone's feeling more calm. Okay. Wouldn't this behavior be a safety concern that you shouldn't ignore? And I guess from my perspective, it, it doesn't seem like a safety concern, but absolutely, if you get to a point where you feel like they are in some way harming themselves or, or putting themselves at risk for harm, then absolutely, you might want to intervene and, and help guide the child into walking more appropriately. But for the most part, to me, this this feels like um, just kind of an annoying behavior um, that we can practice ignoring. Okay. And so whenever we're facing a challenging behavior, we want to focus on prevention strategies like we already talked about before jumping straight to to responses such as consequences. Pause for a second. Um, we've got another question here. So should we be looking at and addressing the parents' feelings of embarrassment? This could be the child trying to be fun and silly and the parents are missing a time to connect. And that's a really great point too. And, and that's maybe where in the context of a presentation, we can only give you so much information about a, um, a situation. But in, in therapy, you're really going to explore more about the function of the behavior, right? Is the child trying to be fun or silly? Um, or is this just kind of a, an, an annoying habit that they always do, right? Um, so if they're always jumping around, it's probably a little bit less fun and silly. And maybe there are certain times where it is okay for parents to, to connect with the kid if they're at home um, and there's less of that embarrassment because we're not in a social situation. Um, so again, we're, we're trying to use our attention strategically to teach the child um, when this behavior is an appropriate behavior, like at home, um, and, and how to decrease that behavior in a public situation. Thanks for these great questions, you guys. We really appreciate the discussion. Okay, so sometimes we need to, to jump in and, and use some consequences when our prevention strategies haven't been working. Um, and we want to frame these consequences as learning opportunities for the child. So the goal of a consequence is not to make the child feel bad, but we just want them to kind of experience the results of their choices in a safe and supportive environment. Um, and so just because we, we don't want the child to feel bad, it doesn't mean that we have to make them feel happy when they're faced with a consequence they don't like. Um, and this is, again, it's just a, it's a learning opportunity. And so when used as part of an overall positive parenting approach, these natural and logical consequences are not only effective, but they actually help decrease the likelihood of parents using more harsh or punitive approaches. And again, we, we don't want to confuse discipline and punishment, right? So um, what punishment does at best is, is really just immediately stop or suppress the behavior that the kid is, is doing. But the problem is that what happens is, is the behavior doesn't change long term. And so with discipline, we're, we're, we're framing these as learning opportunities and helping the kid learn how to, to respond um, in a more socially appropriate and, and responsible way to these situations. And so a natural consequence is, is when we just stop reflexively stepping in to save the child from experiencing the results of their choices. And so we just want to let kids experience this learning opportunity without adult intervention. And so allowing a child to experience the natural consequences of their action helps build some resilience and helps them become more self-sufficient. So when we're, we're going to respond to some behaviors, we, we need to be kind of pick and choose our battles. So for example, you guys are, are going out for a walk and the child refuses to wear a jacket on a chilly day. Instead of insisting that the child wears the jacket and getting into a fight about it and turning it into a big thing, we let the child walk without a jacket and let them get kind of chilly, right? And then they'll learn, okay, maybe I need to wear a jacket when it's cold outside. 
Um, or the kid doesn't put their laundry in the hamper to get cleaned. And so instead of having the parent come in and, and save it and save the kid and pick it up and do their laundry anyway, those clothes just don't get washed. And the child has to experience the natural consequence of like, well, shoot, now I can't wear the outfit I really wanted to wear today because I didn't put it in the hamper. And so these are, are little things that, again, are easy to, to let the child experience that natural consequence so they can really see what happens. Um, but natural consequences aren't always appropriate or helpful or sufficient. So whenever a child um, or another person's safety at risk is at risk, we need to try something different. We we don't want the natural consequence of running into the street to be getting hit by a car because um, we want to keep our kids safe. Um, sometimes in situations where there's too much delay in feedback, a natural consequence isn't going to be helpful. So, for example, if a child is struggling to brush their teeth, they might get cavities later on, but that consequence, that natural consequence isn't immediate enough for it to have a benefit on the child. And then sometimes the consequence might be too abstract for the child, right? So um, the natural consequence of being like the stinky kid at school is that peers might look at you strangely. And for some kids, especially kids who don't really notice or understand social care cues, they won't really have the opportunity to learn from that consequence and they might need a more helpful concrete way to understand social rules around hygiene. Um, so sometimes we need to move into these clearly defined logical consequences for misbehavior just to help children develop their most optimal self-regulation skills. Um, and so some examples of logical consequences. So when a child throws a toy and is starting to get aggressive with a toy, we remove the toy for a short period of time. So they're using a, an item inappropriately, so that item goes to timeout. If the child spills something at the table or on the floor, the consequ logical consequence is that they help clean it up. Um, if a child is playing unsafely, they need to take a break until they're calm and then they can rejoin play. Um, and then sometimes we have to get a little bit more um, kind of abstract with the child's not doing their homework. Okay, well, now you can't watch your shows or play video games tonight until your homework's done. And so when we're thinking about creating logical consequences, obviously, they need to be logical. So we want the consequence to be somewhat related to the behavior um, or losing a privilege or, or kind of having to do an additional chore. We want the delay um, between the behavior and the consequence to be as short as possible to really help the child understand the cause and effect of their behavior. We want consequences to be known ahead of time. We want to give a child a warning or a heads up and allow them to adjust their behavior, right? Going back to that consistency and the predictability. We also want to be respectful when giving consequences. So um, just because we're getting a consequence, we want to keep that, keep the reasoning um, calm. We don't need to raise our voices or make it a big emotional reaction. Um, and then we want the consequence to be incremental and proportionate. So kind of giving children more learning opportunities to prevent them from feeling discouraged. So we don't want to jump to, you can't watch shows for a whole week because you didn't do your homework for one day. And then we, I frame timeout as, as a logical consequence, but really I like to save timeout for the most severe behaviors like aggression. So timeout is simply the removal of a child from all types of reinforcement. So parents' attention, toys, screen time, playing, et cetera, for a specified and short period of time as a consequence for their misbehavior. There's decades of research that shows that when used correctly, timeout is a safe and positive option to teach children to behave well. So I'm going to launch another poll um, because there's always a lot of controversy about timeout. So how do parents typically respond when you bring up the idea of timeout? Okay, 
So you can see the responses here um, for what you guys are experiencing in your, your therapies. So a lot of parents are coming in saying they've already tried timeout and it doesn't work for their child or they don't think it's going to be effective. Um, and that is a common response that I get a lot as well. Um, and this is where I like to, to teach parents about kind of the evidence-based approach to, to using timeout and really kind of reminding them what timeout really is supposed to be. Like I said, it's, it's brief. We're removing the child from all types of reinforcement. Um, and a lot of times parents are worried like, okay, isn't this just a way for my kid to get out of doing the things I want them to do? Um, but really, when, when timeouts used correctly, timeout actually teaches children to uh, obey more often and, and more quickly. Um, and when we set age appropriate limits and follow through with with consequences like timeout, it helps children learn positive behavior. And when again, when used correctly, timeout is a safe, effective way to help children learn to regulate their behavior. So I like to, again give parents psychoeducation about timeout and what that's going to look like. Um, and we spend a lot of time creating this process and talking about why it's helpful. Okay, and what is my theory on timeout and how it relates to PCIT? Okay, so yes, timeout is, a, is an important part of, of PCIT. Um, and so if we head on to the next slide, um, when we're teaching about timeout, we want to make sure we're giving parents tools to make sure that timeout is done effectively and without any harm. And so on the right hand side of the screen here, you can see this is pretty much the, the PCIT language and approach to using timeout. We provide a brief explanation for the timeout. You hit mom, so you have to sit in timeout. We minimize attention while guiding the child to the timeout spot. Okay, sit here until I say you can get off. And then the child stays in timeout for about three to five minutes plus a few seconds of quiet. And so then we, again, keep our, our language and our procedures consistent, simple. You're sitting quietly in timeout. Are you ready to say sorry? And so the timeout approach that I use is actually really similar to the PCTI approach, PCIT approach. Um, I don't always go into the whole like um, backup timeouts that PCIT does when the child is escaping the timeout location. But again, it's really dependent on, on the family and, and the client and what's going on. And so here are some, some strategies or, or some things that I like to share with parents to help kind of teach them about how to do timeout correctly and effectively. So timeout is not supposed to be an escape. Um, after the child serves their timeout, they need to go back and, and complete the task that the child, or that they were originally instructed to do, or apologize if they're being aggressive, somehow kind of redo that behavior. Um, we also know that through research, timeout is most effectively used with children between the ages of two to seven years old, and then it becomes a lot less effective. So we don't want to be using timeout with a lot older children. We want to keep timeout short. Um, so for children be age, between the ages of two to seven, again, timeout really doesn't need to exceed three to five minutes. Um, research has found that there's really no evidence that any longer of a timeout um, has any bigger or more helpful effects. Um, but with, with this, thinking about timeout length, we want to make sure that we end timeout only after the child is quiet for a few seconds. So we don't want timeout to end on a timer. Um, we want timeout to end when the child is showing us that they're calm and quiet. And again, that's because it's helping children learn that they're once they can regulate their emotions, then they can do what they want to do again. Timeout works because a child has nothing of interest to him or her, so it's it's boring. We're supposed, we need to remove any fun or distracting objects from the timeout space and avoid giving the child any attention because, again, any attention is good attention in a child's book, so we want it to be completely boring. And we need timeout to be in a safe environment, so find a place where different objects are out of reach, the child can't hurt themselves um, or, or hurt others um, or destroy objects. 
but we do want to make sure that parents are remaining in a place where they're able to still see the child in timeout, but they shouldn't be like too close or making a lot of eye contact and in, in interactions that way. And again, timeout needs to be used sparingly. Uh, like I said before, I like to save it for those most severe behaviors like aggression. Like I said, timeout isn't always appropriate for all kids, especially as they're getting older or they might start running from timeout. So an alternative uh, to timeout for older children and even adolescents is, is job card grounding. So this job card grounding procedure is a predictable consequence for older children that eliminates any arguing or lecturing that might be going on. So any attention or reaction they might be getting for behavior but it also gives the child a sense of control. And so when we use job card grounding, the child is grounded from all of their privileges until they complete the job card that's assigned to them. And so with this, the child really gets to determine how long they're grounded for. The grounding only lasts as long as it takes for them to get the job done. So that could be 15 minutes or it could be a day or three days or longer. Um, and with these jobs, we want them to be simple jobs. Um, they shouldn't take too long to complete, and they definitely need to be different than the child's regularly assigned chores and your regularly assigned chores. So we don't want parents to feel like they're stuck, like, oh, my kid didn't get in trouble today, and so now I have to go do all of these chores that they didn't earn. Um, and so I included some examples of some job cards that I use regularly. Um, as well as a link to, to even more job cards. So I like to hand these directly to parents um, and say, pick the ones that make most sense for your family. And then I give them some instructions on how to implement this at home. Okay, and then finally, we can both prevent and respond to challenging behaviors by modeling and practicing skills. So identifying what skills the child needs to build, whether that be emotion regulation, listening, following instructions, sharing, overcoming anxiety, social skills. We want to encourage parents to model these skills um, all the time um, and label them, right? We, we forget that children learn through modeling. Um, so we want to, to show the behavior we want to see in the child and we want to point it out in other people. Um, we want to also practice these skills during neutral times. So setting up for a kid who, who's struggling with coping skills, set aside a few minutes each day where we pick a coping card and we practice that coping skill together. And this can be in therapy, but also outside of therapy to help the child get a lot more practice in using these skills. Um, if a child needs to work on following directions, set up five minute listening drills and make them really play based and, and low stakes instructions like, hey, go give me, go get me that Kleenex or hey, give me a high five, jump up and down. And just in a fun way, help the kid practice and learn that listening and following instructions gets them more of what they want. You get to keep playing. You get to keep doing those fun things. Um, when you're working with a kid with anxiety, for example, set up some bravery exercises. One of my favorites is, is helping kids be brave in the dark. So we're going to start by being in their room with the lights on, and then we're going to work our way up to like having a scavenger hunt in our bedroom with the lights completely off. And we're just using a flashlight or, or something like that to help them overcome that, that fear in an exciting way. Um, we can also go back to using some coaching or scaffolding to provide support for using this skill during challenging situations. Um, and so we want to Again, we, we don't expect kids to know everything and be able to do everything right away. And, and as parents and therapists, we're here to help with the coaching and the scaffolding in the moment. And then finally, we want to follow up using some rewards and, and consequences to help shape those identified skills that we need to be building up. So again, when we keep giving a lot of reward or positive attention and praise to the behaviors we want to see more of with anxiety, like, wow, you were so brave going into that dark room. Um, that helps, again, the, the kid is now more motivated to, to do those brave thing, things because they get a lot of positive attention and reactions for that behavior. Okay. And so just kind of to sum up, some of these these skills that we have been talking about today. I'm going to launch the a fourth poll here. The 
Okay, so whenever a nine-year-old is instructed to turn off his video games and get ready for bed, he throws a big tantrum, including yelling, um, things like, I'm not going to, going to bed, you can't make me, while continuing to keep playing his games. Parents typically respond by saying, I'm your parent, you have to do what I say. But the child just continues to tantrum and argue and effectively stalls bedtime until parents finally threaten to get rid of the child's video game system altogether. The child eventually starts to get ready for bed and parents ignore him until he climbs into bed. So thinking about all of the, the different prevention and response strategies that we discussed today, what might you suggest the parent do differently? And you can select all of them that, that makes sense. Okay, our answers are slowing down. Um, so we'll share the results here. And this is kind of a trick question because all of these answers can be correct, right? And again, it's going to depend a little bit on the relationship you have with the family, what their main concerns are, what their goals are, et cetera. But there's a lot of prevention strategies that we can work on. So having some transition warnings to help kind of warn the kid and prepare him for something that's gonna be hard that he doesn't wanna do. We can prevent by establishing some house rules for electronic use, like there are certain times and locations and ways that we use electronics, and here's what happens if we don't follow those rules. We can practice transitioning away from video games appropriately. Um, sometimes I like to, to set up these practices and be like, okay, it's time to turn off the video game. And when the kid listens and does that really well the first time, I'm going to reward them by saying, you know what, you get five extra minutes of video game playing because I love how great you, you were with putting it away. Um, so again, make good things happen for them when um, when when he's doing things that are are appropriate and well. Um, responding with empathy. It's okay to to be like, I know you're mad. You have to turn off the video game and go to bed, but that's the rule. That's the expectation. We gotta follow through. We might need to respond with a logical consequence, like you know, okay, well, if we can't get off video games today, then we might not get the opportunity to play video games tomorrow. And then responding with your differential attention strategies, right? So um, parents can work on ignoring the tantrum, but I want them to really quickly return their attention. So the minute that that kid turns off the video game, I want them to start praising that behavior and giving more attention and, and praising him for getting ready for bed and, and doing his bedtime routine and hopping into bed instead of just ignoring him during that process. And then finally, as I was, was mentioning, as we're setting the stage for working with, with young children, it's really important to connect with, with the school setting. We know there's a lot of research documenting that a positive homeschool connection has positive outcomes for students, parents, and teachers alike. Um, and most of the children that we see in therapy are eligible to receive additional supports through school. One of the strategies that I really like to recommend is, is this daily behavior report card. And so it's used to increase feedback to the student and pro promote success in the school setting. So here you, you pick a couple target behaviors. We state them positively as in seeing the behaviors we want the child to do. Like I follow directions with just one warning or I, I use respectful words and actions. I use my coping strategies. We want to start with just about two goals at a time. And then once the student's doing really well um, and meeting their goals that we set, then we can add in some new goals. And so here the child is getting a lot more positive feedback and corrective feedback as needed um, on these goals that they're working on. And then to, to follow up with that, we want parents and caregivers and teachers to really provide a lot of reinforcement and make a big deal about meeting those daily.
bowls at school. Uh, when parents get involved, kids are, are learning like, oh, okay, school is really important. Um, and it helps just kind of get some buy-in. Okay, and then finally, here are a lot of my go-tos for, for parent training and child skills practice in my clinic. And these are all evidence-based interventions. You can see I, I linked PCIT and then the, the PCIT version for, for helping with anxiety busting, um, as well as some other resources and some links to some uh, evidence-based interventions. So again, we're not going to go into detail about all of these because there's so many great resources out there, but just wanted to share some of our go-tos. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Young to kind of fill in the gap for that adolescence phase. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Schumacher. I know I learned a lot. I was not trained in timeout procedures at all. So that was really helpful for me because um, I just, there absolutely were some myths that I had some preconceived notions to. All right, so let's go ahead and get started in talking about how can we support early adolescents. I um, am a mental health care provider in middle school, so I work within that kind of really fun age range where hormones are running wild and kids are really, really starting to test the limits and um, identify more with their friends. And so to me, this is a really awesome time to kind of help support youth and families as they're really starting in this transition to this child to becoming a fully formed and independent individual. Like Dr. Schumacher was sharing, um, it's extremely important to get um, to set the stage. And that really is no different when working with teenagers. And when in setting the stage, it's really important to work with both the teen and the caregivers to identify shared goals and values as they, as well as their own individual values. So coming together with the teen and parent to identify together, what do we want to see different? And then also helping the teen identify what do they want to work as an, on as an individual? And then being sure that we're also helping the parent get what they want out of therapy, especially because they're the ones that are paying for our services. Additionally, I find it extremely helpful and, imp and important to set clear expectations for how youth and parents are going to be engaging in therapy, meaning you might set expectations that a parent's always available to meet during the last 20 minutes of the therapy sessions to really help co-develop with the parent and the teen recommendations um, that we want to work on between now and the next therapy appointment. I find that when parents are really involved in the recommendations and giving that input, as well as the teens, that the follow through on what we recommend is a lot greater. And lastly, we're probably, as we're working with teens, going to come across families who have been struggling for a really, really long time. Um, and are maybe coming to therapy for the first time ever in their life, um, or maybe they've engaged in therapy before, but just really do not have a lot of success in that. When we're meeting with families who are at this point, it's really critical that we approach them with openness, and I'm sure all of you do that. But I really want to reinforce that idea that, you know, I and I consistently tell parents, because I have a lot of parents who come in and tell me, oh, I just feel so bad. Like I, I, I didn't, um, I feel bad that I haven't like done these things or I haven't asked these questions before. And I always reinforce, you know, I'm not in the business of shaming you as parents, right? That's not my role. My role is to help you get to where you want to be. Um, so let's figure out what's currently working and let's figure out where we want to go. And this really helps aid the rapport and building, um, rapport building with both the parent and the adolescent and will also aid in the, development of recommendations that you want to provide. Whoa. Okay. There we go. Sorry, my computer's a little wonky sometimes. So why would we care about values and why would we care about teens' values? Um, when working with teens after the initial appointment as at, and after providing psychoeducation, maybe, you know, if they're coming in with worry thoughts or if they're coming in with low mood, you know, we give some give them some information so that they have some language to kind of discuss some of their concerns. But then I pretty immediately jump into um, working with the teen to understand their values. And values are often shaped 
before the teenage years um, and often become more solidified as they continue on throughout adolescence. We see through research as well um, that values, much like personality, is stable throughout the, are stable throughout the lifetime. So it's really important um, that as kids and adolescents are going through this developmental period um, where they're really identifying who they want to be as an individual, they're trying to gain some autonomy and some independence, it's really a time to discuss what kinds of things do you find important? Um, and how does that align with your friends or your parents or your school or your community? Adolescents um, use values to help make decisions and to help prioritize what kind of um, things do I need to kind of get done first or last? And they also find that discussing values is helpful. So I was doing some research about why we would ever talk about values with adolescents. And I came across a qualitative study um, where they interviewed teens about values and if they think about them, talk about them, or use them in their everyday life. And the article stated that despite indicating that thinking about and behaving according to their values was an automatic process, at the end of the interview, of that research interview, most teens commented that having the opportunity to consciously think and talk about their values had been a positive and helpful experience. So then how do we do that within the therapeutic context? Um, especially if you are familiar with acceptance commitment theory, we know that this is something that we really implement throughout um, our treatment approach. On this slide, we have linked some materials to different activities that I often use with preteens to help them understand their values and how we can help them live life in a way that's in aligned with their values. Um, and so I often start the therapeutic relationship with these types of activities because it really shapes how I uh, provide recommendations. The values uh, discussion cards are just question prompts um, that you go through with the adolescent to get them thinking about the things that they value if maybe they don't have anything kind of clarified yet. And you might identify some themes as, your, as the therapist. The values card sort is an activity where teens just sort different ideas and activities and how important they are to them. And the values bullseye is really just another way for teens to think about their values. I'm going to take us through a strategy next from motivational interviewing that will demonstrate why discussing and clarifying their values is really important to the treatment for, te for teens. I do see that first that we have a um, Q&A. So do you find that you often have to help clients discern compelled values to their own personal true values? Yes. In my specialty of eating disorders and using ACT, I often have to separate those differing sets of values. Yes, 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 yes. Um, so I talk about that a lot. I make it very clear to teens um, that you might have some of these values. It might be the same as what your parents want from you. It might be the same as what your teachers want from you. But honestly, I'm not here to tell you that it needs to be aligned. You might have some different values than them. That's okay. We're here to identify what you value and how we can um, get you more of that in your life. Um, so I get a lot of, um, I should, I should do my homework more. I should pay attention more in school, that that's, that's a value I um, should have. Um, but then I have a very frank conversation with them. Well, do you value <laughs> going to school and paying attention and doing your homework? No, I don't. Okay. So you want to do less of school. Perfect. We have all these expectations, right? We have homework, we have projects, we have to attend school. So given all those facts that we have to fulfill those things, what can we do to spend less time doing school? Maybe that looks like putting our phone away for a little bit so we can get through a math assignment quicker. Maybe it looks like asking a, the teacher a question so we're not sitting here Googling things for 30 minutes before we're trying to um, uh, figure out how to respond to a question. Um, but yes, I absolutely do that. And I do make it a focus um, of therapy. Excellent question. All right. So when we're doing motivational interviewing, um, motivational interviewing within itself um, is an intervention. It was 
developed um, to help individuals stop smoking, um, as well as stop using sub other substances. Um, but there's been more research about how we can embed motivational interviewing throughout the therapeutic process, as well as how do we use this with teens, right? So it was developed with adults who are abusing substances, but how do we kind of pair it back and still use these effective strategies with teens? And so this is something I use a lot, and this can be really, this can be extremely helpful um, when you're working with teens who demonstrate that cognitive dissonance, right? Like, I should be doing my homework, I should be paying attention to class, but I don't want to be doing that because it's more fun to, like, go on YouTube. Um, so before getting to this point, this we have had those discussions about what the teen values um, and also having a clear idea of what the teen wants to be working on through therapy. And this could be doing things like homework, completing chores, being nicer to siblings, getting to school on time. And the goal of the decisional balance here is to make that cognitive dissonance explicit, that there are both pros and cons for changing their behavior and not changing their behavior. And eventually we want to get them to that point where they are um, making a decision in line with the type of person that they wanna be and in line with their values. So I'm actually gonna take us through a quick example of how this might look. And this is something, again, I, I use a lot for a lot of different behaviors. So let's say a teen, um, is arguing with their parents about chores, and that's causing a lot of conflict in the family, even though the teen does eventually do their chores. So they're putting up a fight, but they eventually get to it. Neither the teen or the parent like how things are currently going, but the teen and the parent agree that life would look better if the teen just did their chores automatically. However, despite the teen realizing this, they continue to engage in this argumentative behavior and it's really clear that the teen um, has cognitive dissonance about if they should really do their chores the first time or if they just like want to just argue to see if they can get out of their chores. So within this decisional balance, staying the same looks like the teen continuing to argue with their parent and changing the behavior looks like completing uh, the chores when the parent asks. In a therapy session then, we can work with the teen to understand the reasons for staying the same or changing, and let's just see how this might play out. Okay, so with the teen, I might ask them, all right, so staying the same looks like just continuing to argue with our parent about chores. What are the advantages of just you doing whatever you're doing right now? The teen might say, well, I usually then don't have to do the chores, I usually can get out of it, and also chores aren't fun, so I just don't like doing them. Hey, totally valid. This is sustained talk. These are all the reasons why the kid would not want to change their behavior. Totally valid. Chores aren't fun. I don't like doing chores either. <laughs> However, there are some disadvantages, right? That's why we're here. So if I continue to argue with my parent about chores, I get yelled at and I probably lose my phone, right? That, that also has happened. This is change shock. These are all the reasons why a child might um, want to not continue what they're doing. Okay, so there's both advantages and disadvantages for staying the same. We might ask them, okay, so then let's say you um, want to change your behavior, right? Let's just say you want to complete chores when the parent, when your parent first asks. Why would you not want to do that? Well, I just don't like doing my chores. Okay, totally fine, valid. That's the same talk. And then we would ask them, well, what are the advantages if you change? If you just, you know, complete chores when your parent first asks, what, what would you expect to look different for you? My parent might get off my back. I get to keep my phone. I might get yelled at less. And I, maybe I might be able to hang out with my friends more because then I don't get in trouble. Okay. Just more reasons why we would want to change our behavior. So I have the teen, write all of these things out. I print off this form for them. I write them out. And then at the end, I ask them, so based on all that you wrote down, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? If the child is ready to change, it's like, dang, like I should just do it the first time, I guess. I'm not going to like it, but I guess I'll do it. Then awesome. You can develop a plan to help them engage in changing their behavior. 
And if the child's not ready to change, they're like, well, like, I don't care. Like, I really like, I just don't want to do it. I don't want to change. And like my parents, like, I don't care if my parents yell at me. Okay. Then we, that's our cue to then go back, understand their values. So you said that you wanted to change your behavior before we did this, but do you really want to? Is it really a value of yours to be doing these chores um, and really exploring that more um, with the adolescent so that they feel more bought into that process and might get them to be motivated to change their behavior later on down the road? So it's really important then to clarify our values if a kid is using more sustained talk. All right. So um, let's go through a little case example here. Um, as we jump into some other strategies that we can use with adolescents. So a 14-year-old is prompted to complete their daily chores. He walks into the room and the parent with the parent, so the parent was in another room, and the teen sits down silently with a smirk on their face. And the child says, I don't care. I don't have to. And then rolls their eyes. The parent provides a reminder that he will then lose his phone if he doesn't do his chores. The, the child then continues with that behavior while starting to complete the chore. What would be the function of this behavior? It is attention, right? He started doing the chores. <laughs> he just had to get, uh, he had to bid for his parents' attention before by having that smirk, rolling the eyes, saying, I don't have to, I don't care. And they still saying that as they continue, as they start to do their chore. So the function of this behavior is attention. And just like Dr. Dr. Schumacher was sharing, differential attention is a really effective strategy. And we typically think about it in terms of with little kids, but I, it's really helpful with preteens and teens alike. And it really is a helpful tool when the function of that behavior is attention. So, Differential attention for teens still looks like attending to positive and or neutral behavior and ignoring um, the annoying or the negative behavior. So working with parents to implement differential attention, you would recommend that parents provide positive attention for following their expectations, engaging or in neutral behaviors, or even any approximation of the desired behavior. So let's say the desired behavior was to go to their room to start picking up their room. If the child is starting to walk towards the room, even though they're, you know, mumbling under their breath, doing all the things that teens do, that's really annoying. We still are providing attention for that. Hey, thanks for walking towards your room to start picking up. Um, and then, for example, um, oh, yeah, there we go. And importantly, the parent would then ignore um, the annoying or the negative behaviors as long as the child's being physically safe. So why it's important to use this combination of um, positive um, attention for desired behavior, ignoring um, the annoying behavior is because it demonstrates to the teen what behavior receives the caregiver's attention and what behavior does not receive attention. And importantly, and this is something I talk a lot about with families, that differential attention is not icing the teen out. It's not giving the teen the cold shoulder or really giving them the silent treatment. Um, we are still giving the attention to the teen that they deserve and that they need. Um, but we are ignoring the behaviors that we don't want to see anymore. So we're going to play this through um, with an example. So it's the same exact case, right? So if this 14-year-old it's prompted to do his daily chores, smirks, says, I don't care, rolls his eyes, and the parent provides that reminder that he'll lose his phone. The child continues on with this behavior while starting to complete the chore. So before the child started meeting with me, um, without that differential attention, the parent is yelling at the child then because they're super annoyed, like they're at their wit's end. I don't want to be talked to this way. The child then responds back with yelling and calling parents the name. Um, and then the parents just fed up with it, doesn't like leaves the room or has a kid go away. Um, the chore then goes incomplete and then the child loses their phone. So at the end of the day, really nobody wins in this situation, right? But then once we started implementing differential attention, the parent provided praise for starting the chore and approximations for the other 
desired behavior. So remaining calm or, um, you know, providing that praise for, hey, thanks for going to the kitchen to start um, doing the dishes. The parent then ignores the I don't have to's and the eye rolls. And at the end of the day, then the chore was able to be completed and the child gets to keep their phone. This means that both the child and the parent wins. Parent got the chore done and the kid got to keep their phone and they got some positive attention for doing what they were told. This is not foolproof, right? This is not going to work the very first time that a parent ever implements it. Dr. Schumacher was talking about those extinction bursts that a kid's probably going to amp it up. They're going to amp um, up the ante um, because that's worked for them in the past. Um, so we have to really work with parents, to let them know like you have to be in a state where you can follow through on the expectation and remain calm. I give parents, honestly, a lot of outs of, um, you know, if you are not in the space where you can remain calm when following through on an expectation, it's okay. Let that go for today and follow through on it tomorrow when you are in a better headspace. Because ultimately, we're trying to also decrease that course of cycle where teens and parents are just going at it. Um, so I give parents that permission to give themselves some of that grace and flexibility if they can't follow through on something that day and at that time. Um, so I think that's also been really helpful. Okay, next slide here. So um, you're working with a 12-year-old child who has autism spectrum disorder. The child's parents explain that the child never completes their chores without a fight. In fact, the child would often resort to screaming, calling others' names, and laying in the middle of the living room floor. The parent often responds with, stop screaming, that's not nice, and do your chores. Parents are extremely frustrated and ask for your help in getting the child to just do his chores. So based on your misunderstanding, or based on your understanding of behavior, the child is trying to avoid chores and it appears that avoidance is maintained by attention that the child may receive from their parents. So they're trying to get out of their chores, but they're doing everything to make it known that they don't want to do it. They're like in the middle of the floor. They're calling people names. So what differential attention strategies might you recommend to these parents? So I believe this is a, um, this could be a select all that apply. I'm not sure if that is something that is allowed, but if it's not, you can just choose your favorite answer. <laughs> we'll see what the responses are as they roll in. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing people answer, ignoring the streaming, providing attention to the approximations. Uh-huh. Awesome. Thank you so much for your quick responses. I'll give you another 10 seconds or so to filter in. Okay. All righty. I'm going to end this poll here and share the results so you all can kind of see what was going on. Um, so, yeah. So, if we're trying to um, implement differential attention, we would want to ignore that screaming behavior, super important. And we'd also want to provide attention to approximations for that desired behavior. So thank you so much for standing up and going to the kitchen or going to your room to start uh, fulfilling your chores. Ignoring the child altogether. Um, so when the function of behavior is attention, ignoring the child altogether will likely up the ante because what they're trying to do is get your attention. So what we want to do is provide feedback to the child in vivo, in the moment, about what kinds of behaviors get their attention. Like, thank you for standing up. Thank you for using a calm body. And then when the child starts the chore, parents should walk away. Um, I could see how this might work, but after a lot of shaping and molding of that positive behavior. Um, so when the child is starting to that chore, that's when we really want to up the attention and the positive feedback that we're giving them. Thank you so much for um, unloading the dishwasher and then putting the dishes away in the cabinets. That makes me really happy. Providing that explicit feedback is really important. All right, I'm seeing a question. Is it realistic that if a child who is emotionally dysregulated, that they are absorbing praise or reinforcement of the desired behavior? Ooh, really good question. Um, I guess it kind of depends on how emotionally dysregulated um, that they might be. 
So I think they would hear the reinforcement of the desired behaviors, ignore the child altogether. Like if they, if the parent walks away, that could be, that could be an effective strategy. Um, I guess, you know, Dr. Schumacher, I would love to hear kind of your response. I was referring to the specific situation you're presenting. Yeah, it really, I think it all depends. And this is where it is important to use kind of you know, our individual therapy um, to be sure that the child has those skills. And if the child is maybe then engaging in those self-regulation responses, providing positive feedback for that child um, as they're engaging in that, Dr. Schumacher, do you have any ideas? Yeah, I was, I'll just add that I think kids are, are really keen on picking up on attention. So when kids are um, acting out and we're giving our, our negative attention in the terms of like scolding or yelling or lecturing or something, they're, they're picking up on that attention. And so I would assume um, the opposite is true, that they're able to pick up on that positive attention as well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks for that perspective. Really a uh, nice question that kind of got me thinking really hard there. Thank you so much for asking that. All right. Okay, executive functioning. This is a big task that teens have to demonstrate um, as they're transitioning into middle school and then into high school. Um, executive functioning is extremely important and it's really a set of skills and behaviors that develop as somebody ages and has to be modeled for us. So most everyone has the ability to develop these skills with modeling and practice. However, it's important that, that we help families and schools with setting clear expectations, ensuring the developmental appropriateness of the expectations, and considering why or how executive functioning might be challenging for the teens. Super quickly, I see another question. Um, a 12-year-old has been told by parents that they have one hour of electronics per day, so he sneaks when they are sleeping. Oh, yes, a classic thing. The parents, in turn, ground him for electronics for weeks at a time. Suggestions for alternatives. Yes. Okay, so... What I tend to recommend in a situation like this, um, so if they have an hour of electronics a day, that's just a given, um, but then if he sneaks around with them, then he gets electronics taken. This is where I like to think through with the parent, is it appropriate um, as we're going to eventually reintroduce these video games? Um, so usually what happens is that the parents already taken them away by the time they're in our therapy office, like the next week or something like that. So I ask them, you know, what behaviors do we need to see from the child in order for them to earn them back? Um, rather than having it be a time um, for several weeks, we want to ask them what they expect the child to demonstrate before um, they can earn back video games. And then video, like earning those video games or having video game time then is contingent on meeting these expectations. It's kind of the first then suggestion that Dr. Schumacher was talking about. So maybe if the expectation is um, they get their chores done, then you can earn um, 30 minutes. And then that video game is then taken away. If the child is sneaking them, however, what I would want to try to do is um, reinforce behavior for um, not sneaking. Um, so can they earn additional video game time for fulfilling expectations and for not sneaking the video games? Um, that's a really hard one. I would ask, I would, I'm asking kind of a little bit more questions. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really good prompt. Um, I see that somebody is raising their hand. I'm not sure if they're able to speak. A um, few people are raising their hands. Oh, okay. I don't know how to address that. Um, where are the attendees who are raising their hands? Okay. Well, I'm gonna we, allow, yeah. I was, gonna, I, I was gonna say we I don't know if we have the option for them to yeah. talk I see in that, the webinar. Yeah, I see that I can press allow to talk. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, perfect. <laughs> okay, uh, Cleveland, I'm going to throw it to you. I see that your hand is raised. So I asked you to unmute if you're okay with that. Okay, I don't think I did it. I was going to say, if it doesn't work, we might ask instead of raising hand just to do the q and I'm yeah. not 
100% sure if it'll work or not. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh my gosh. No worries. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much for the individuals who are raising their hand. I really wish um, we can give you the permissions to talk, but just given the uh, format of this, we're just going to ask that you type out your questions. Um, yes. Okay, while you're all typing those things out, I'm going to continue on talking about executive functioning. Okay, so with executive functioning, it's really important to have clear expectations um, and then also focusing on the behavior that we want to see versus the behavior that we do not want to see. And throughout this process, it's really important to involve the team to ensure that they have an understanding of how and why expectations need to be met in certain ways. It's usually helpful, too, to understand if there is any sort of choice or flexibility in how expectations are met. And these points of choice or flexibility can be really helpful in garnering the teen's buy-in into following through on these expectations. And for the sake of time, because um, we're coming up almost on our two hours, and I want to be sure that we address any questions that you all might have at the end of the presentation, I'm going to leave this slide here as it is. And I also wanted to orient everybody to what is developmentally appropriate um, for teens in this age group. I'm not going to read through this entire list in full, um, but I want to let you know that this information is in the slides as well as the texts that we can expect for both younger and older kids. So I have a developmentally appropriate executive functioning tasks all the way from ages uh, like three um, to like 18 years old. Um, so feel free to look at those slides, the younger through older kids, that information is included at the very end of the slide deck and the supplemental slides that we have. Mm -hmm. Okay, so somebody asked, aren't extended consequences such as weeks of the same consequence counterproductive? Um, yeah, so Julie, I... I tend to agree with that, um, and that's usually why I ask parents to really detail out, okay, so you took away this um, privilege um, because you're frustrated with something or you're frustrated with the way that they were acting. So fill me in on why you took this privilege away. Well, because they never listen to me, because they never do their homework, because they're super disrespectful. So then I work with the parent then to understand, okay, so then what you want to see is even with video games that the child's listening to you, that they're being respectful and that they're completing their homework or following through on their expectations. Okay, so let's detail what that exactly looks like with you and your teenager. So we all have a working agreement on what behavior we want to see more of. And then we talk through how we can then reintroduce those privileges for following through on those expectations that we co-developed. Um, because like Rachel was talking about, we want to be sure that these consequences are logical. Um, and that's just a really key component that we are reinforcing behavior that we want to see by granting privileges. And by yeah. having those shorter consequences, we're able to give the kid more learning opportunities, right? Exactly. So they will have more opportunities to learn that when I misuse video games, they get taken away. Exactly. Yes. Um, great question. Okay. And then another thing that um, teens are often coming in and working on in therapy or something that parents might or teachers might have concerns on is that the child's having a lot of difficulties focusing in class. Teens often hear like, you just need to pay attention or if you just paid attention, like everything would be fine. However, it's really rare that when we're working with teens um, that they understand what it actually even looks like to pay attention. And often as uh, you know, kids are entering into their teenage years into middle school and high school, that they have different subjects and different teachers that have different expectations for what it actually looks like to pay attention. So an exercise like this can be extremely helpful in working with um, the child to understand what it actually looks like to pay attention. And at the, I'll have this protocol in the slides here for you, but what I want to highlight is really understanding and co-develop why it's important to pay attention in school, using and leaning on the values that you've already discussed with the teenager, 
as well as co-develop a brief description of what it looks like to pay attention in school. I often ask as well, they're like, oh, I just need, just need to pay attention and like, it's, it's all going to be fine. Um, I usually say, perfect. I want to help you pay more attention. How do you do that? How do you pay attention? And they're like, uh, I don't know. They <laughs> really don't know. So then I ask them, okay, well, think about the kid that's always paying attention in class. What are they doing? And then they can usually give me a few different behaviors that that kid engages in to pay attention in class. Um, and so then I use that to build up what we call self-monitoring or self-management skills. I have linked a resource here, um, Changing Behaviors Through Self-Monitoring, that's going to take you through how do you kind of build up something like this and what are some protocols that you can follow for the sake of time. I'm not going to take you all the way through that, but that is a resource that is available to you for free. Additionally, we want to look um, at what it actually looks like to do chores correctly. So parents have a lot of expectations for kids, you know, that when they say sweep the floor, um, it looks like picking up the rugs, shaking out the rugs, putting the rug, you're sweeping the floor, putting the rugs back. But teens don't usually know that, right? We have to teach and model it. So working with the parent and the teen to understand what it looks like to complete the chore can be really helpful. And often what I do is have the parent write out all the steps needed to complete that chore on a note card that the teen can reference as they're completing that chore. And then the parent can provide um, positive and corrective feedback on that behavior. And as those skills are developing, have high rates of monitoring, right? Like I'm, the parents watching the teen complete the chore, providing that corrective feedback and also providing reinforcement for doing the chore well. Okay, so a 12-year-old child comes in with their parent for the initial consult. The parent brings up that the child never does their chores or homework because they are lazy. The parent expects that the child clean their room and do their dishes every single night. The child mentions that they try to start their homework, but usually do not have everything that they need. When it comes to chores, the child shared that they feel like they clean their room and do the dishes, but their parents never happy with it. So now in this poll, what we want you to think about is what would you suggest to the family if you first want to tackle the issues surrounding chores? This is a, you can choose multiple select, all that apply. If you can only choose one, just choose your favorite answer. Um, and yeah, we'll kind of see what comes up. So I'm seeing a pretty popular one right now is working with teens and the parent to understand what it looks like to clean your room and do the dishes, yes. <laughs> It honestly is a super helpful exercise too, just with parents, like having them detail, wait, what does it actually look like when I do this? I think it just makes the behavior more explicit. And then we can provide more opportunities to provide that behavior specific praise for completing all of the steps. Yeah. Okay, tell the parent that it's not developmentally appropriate to expect the teenager to clean their room. So it is, it is uh, developmentally appropriate for the teenager to do these things, to have multiple steps. We might just need to aid them in that process by having something written down on a note card, but that is a developmentally appropriate task. All right. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing the poll there. Um, oh, there we go. <laughs> Okay, another thing that I often talk about is just parenting communication. This communication between teens and parents is really complicated. Teen is really wanting to, you know, is really believing that they have a lot of independence. They don't really need to talk to their parents about different things, but, but the parent wants to keep informed. Um, and so when I work with, with teens, I often go, work, go through this handout with the parent and the team. Um, and discuss, you know, how can we make our communication patterns look differently? So some of the um, general principles is when working with parents, um, having them listen when the teen is in the mood to talk and just really not forcing them to open up. If we're forcing teens to open up and talk about things when they're not ready or don't want to, it can kind of be a 
punishing experience for them, especially if a parent might be judging what the child is saying um, through the use of facial cues or their responses. And so what I encourage a lot of families and parents to do is to use active listening to encourage the teen to express opinions and their feelings and having the parent really kind of manage their own nonverbals and verbal uh, cues so that the child knows that they're parent is just listening to them without judgment because they want to know who they are as an individual. And then both the parent and the teen need to honestly express how they feel good or bad without being hurtful towards each other. In the slides, you should be able to access this handout. You should just like copy and paste it into a Word document. It's just an image um, to and engage the parent and the teen in this activity. Um, at the bottom of that sheet, you'll see um, an activity here. And it's actually really helpful and nice um, to get parents and teens thinking about what are strategies that the other person does that's really helpful in communication. What are some things that I need to look back on and reflect on and maybe change a little bit? Okay, um, so one last poll, and then we'll just open it up to any other questions that you all might have. So you referred a 14-year-old who's demonstrated oppositional behavior at home and at school. The teen gets into many arguments with teachers and parents. The teen tells you that it's funny um, when, parent, when other people get mad. However, the teen describes feeling pissed and think it's really messed up or unfair when they receive um, detention or consequences for their inappropriate behavior. The teen also makes comments like it's hard to pay attention when given a task and it's often unable to complete a task in full. So what strategies discussed today might you try out with this adolescent? Um, you might un try to understand what the child values, differential attention, motivational interviewing, Mm -hmm. So far, a lot of equal, I'm seeing that understanding what the child values and motivational interviewing, that decisional balance, I would absolutely be using those tools. At the end of the day, I would probably use a combination of all of the strategies that we use. It's part of a comprehensive treatment plan. Um, and it, you know, all behavior serves a function from a behaviorist perspective. And so we might have to use um, a bunch of different strategies to ensure that the child is um, getting what they need from treatment. Okay. So what I want to do is just leave you all with some of my favorite coping strategies that I use really helpful with teens in terms of um, emotional regulation. I know that's been something that we've talked a little bit about today, um, but these are just a kind of a combination of DBT, ACT, um, just pretty simple deep breathing, mindfulness activities that I use a lot with teens. But something that I found to be extremely helpful is just helping teens be mindful in their everyday activities. So if a kid is like really interested and playing basketball, um, can that be a mindful activity that they engage in, right? Not that they have to engage in mindful breathing or taking five minutes to be mindful. Can they be mindful while playing basketball? Can they listen to the basketball bounce on the court? Can they notice the texture of the basketball or listen to what it uh, feels like or notice what it feels like or notice what it um, the sound that a basketball makes when it goes through the hoop, um, really embedding mindfulness into their everyday lives and just really noticing their present surroundings has been something that teens really kind of buy into because it's not an additional thing that they have to do. It's just something that they can integrate into their everyday lives. And then just like Dr. Schumacher shared, um, these are just really some of my go-to evidence-based interventions when I'm working with a child who has different mood and anxiety concerns. So these are my favorite um, programs and um, ones that I use a lot with teens um, and that they've really enjoyed. Um, and I use these in combination with all the strategies that I discussed here today. Um, so I'll leave you this with you all. Yes, we just got a question about somebody who lives out in central Nebraska, wondering if they, we have any clinics available throughout Nebraska in order to avoid parents having to travel to Omaha, and we absolutely do. 
And I am a terrible employee because I don't know off the top of my head where all of our clinics are. Um, but if you look at the Monroe Meyer Institute website, um, you'll be able to find different locations. We also um, offer some telehealth um, options for therapy as well through our Monroe Meyer Institute clinics um, for people who are living in the state of Nebraska. Okay, do you think it's appropriate for clients who are a little bit older who might be emotionally stuck at a younger age to use some of these strategy strategies? And absolutely, right? We're always trying to be flexible and, and meet our clients where they're at and, and especially developmentally and emotionally where they're at. Great questions, you guys. Yeah, and I even, I mean working with some like 10 to 11 year olds. Um, it is a little bit different than working with like 13 to 14 year olds. Um, but this is where I usually really explain the science behind why we engage in some of these strategies. So we, we know because we grew up hearing just like, just do some deep breathing or just take a deep breath. Um, but we never really explain why, you know, why we do that. And so I usually lean into um, the science as to why taking deep breathing or focusing on our breath can actually be a really helpful strategy and kind of calming our bodies, calming our minds. Um, so I would think, yeah, absolutely, it is appropriate um, because even as adults, we need <laughs> just some of these basic strategies, right? Because Sometimes we're not taught them. Yeah. yeah. One of my favorite parts of my job is getting to share with people the knowledge that I know so that they can be applying it in their yeah. day-to-day life. I like to joke with families, like my goal is for you to fire me sooner rather than later, because that yes. means you've got a lot of these strategies and resources that you can use on your own. Exactly. Really good questions. 